past. Uh, good afternoon to to everybody, uh, to our colleagues from the different uh, regions of the world. Um, I understand that here we have mainly uh, colleagues from Africa and from Latin America in this group, but also uh, some maybe some people from Asia. Um, so. Uh, well, my my subject uh, here today is uh, to to talk about the general uh, process of um, reforming, uh, of designing, implementing, uh, supporting the implementation and the design of uh, a social protection program. Um, uh, well, you have already seen uh, some of the steps, so I'm going to focus. On, on others, I'm not going to uh, to to go in depth in in those parts which you have already already seen. Um, but uh, before we start, I would like to suggest a quick uh, quiz, a quick uh, a set of uh, three questions. Um, I hope that I can share my my screen with you here so do do you see it colleagues do you see the screen yes we do yes, we do. yes. yes. so my my question to you so my first question to you to see if you if you are uh, knowledgeable about taxation at global level uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think is the country, which country has the highest total tax revenue as percentage of GDP? Uh, I mean, um, um, a proportion of GDP uh, summing, uh, summing up all different sources of taxes, including taxation uh, on the payroll, social security contributions. That's total tax revenue. Uh, there are four options. A, Cuba, B, France, C, Nauru, and D, Sweden. Uh, please write on the chat if you, if you wish to take part, which is the country you think has the highest total tax revenue as a percentage of gdp let's see let's see how close you come to the to the answers i see no answer so far so hilde hilde says it is sweden or oh, another answer for sweden who else? France or France? Well, you need to, to take a decision. France or Sweden? France. Nobody for Cuba, nobody for Nauru. So if you want to answer, I will count to three and then we discuss the results. One, two, three. So those of you who answered France are correct. France has almost 46% of GDP as total tax revenue um, uh, as a percentage of GDP, uh, according to the statistics of OECD in 2018. It used to be Sweden. That's why two people suggested Sweden. Uh, so Sweden has been over the... Um, most of the 20th century, at least the second half of the 20th century, uh, an example of uh, uh, the welfare state and um, with the highest um, total tax revenue. Um, but uh, most re more recently in the current century, uh, it is France which has the highest tax revenue. Sweden has 44%, uh, so two percentage points less than France. Cuba is the highest one in the Americas, 42%. And Nauru is the highest one in uh, Asia Pacific. No? So the second question to you, if you to know if you are knowledgeable about global taxation, 
So hello, I see that our director Shada is also part here. Welcome. So the question is, how much do you think is the revenue that comes from social security contributions in the case of France uh, as a percentage of GDP? Uh, do you think that it is 9%? Do you think it is 14.5%? Do you think it's 15.4 or do you think it's 16 percent? So please type your answers A, B, C, D. What do you think? So Gustavo suggests 15.4 percent. Say Nabu, 16 percent. Yes, there is another. Two, two answers, 16%. Somebody else? I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Okay. Nanya suggests 14.5. Uh, all right. Um, the correct answer is, uh, answer is 16%. Uh, so France has the highest total tax revenue and also the highest social security uh, contributions um, as a proportion of GDP. Uh, the 9% is the average of OECD. Um, there are other countries, many countries in the OECD, which have lower social security contributions as a proportion of GDP. For example, Australia, for example, New Zealand, uh, the United States as well. Uh, so they, they bring the average down to 9%. 14.5% uh, is Germany. Germany is a country with a long tradition of uh, contributory social security systems. And 15.4% is the second highest. It is Slovenia. Uh, also a surprising result. So, well, um, and now the third question is, well, uh, which is the country that you think has the highest proportion of social security contributions if you look at total tax revenue. So where, where do social security contributions represent the largest part right, if you look at total tax revenue? Uh, do you think it's Belgium? That would be answer A. Do you think it's Costa Rica? That would be B. Do you think it is Germany? That would be C. Or do you think it's Uruguay? Uh, Uruguay is also one of the pioneers of contributory social security. That would be answer D. So I wait for your for your quiz answers. A, B, C, or D. What do you think? A, Belgium, D, Uruguay, C, Germany, A, Belgium. A, Belgium, Belgium, yeah, big difference between net and gross salary. Well, you speak from your own experience, Hilde. And uh, C, Germany. So I'm counting to three, one, two, three, and then we talk about the results. So only one person answered correctly, that's C, Germany. In Germany, the proportion of uh, social security contributions is a little bit more than 50% of total tax revenue. Um, Belgium, despite um, the pain you feel in your pocket, Hilde, um, it is 36%. Uh, Costa Rica is the biggest one in the Americas. It's also a, a country with a strong, uh, sorry, yes, you're correct, uh, Shara, two persons answered correctly. Um, so Costa Rica is also a country with a strong, um, a strong uh, presence of contributory social security systems. Uruguay. And Uruguay, uh, Costa Rica and Uruguay are the two biggest ones in the Americas. Um, immediately after Uruguay, there is uh, Brazil, Argentina, uh, which have also a long tradition in terms of contributions. Oops. So, um, well, fine. Um, so let me start then my presentation. Uh, the the title is... 
Excuse me, number, num, question number two, what is the right answer? Because my internet was cut off. The question number two, the right answer was D, France, with 16%. D, the last Thank you. figure, okay? So, well, uh, the title of the presentation is the general process for uh, social protection policy reform. Um, with a certain focus on the issue of fiscal space and financing options. Um, I propose to you the following structure. Um, instead of a country case of fiscal space at the end, we are uh, taking, we will take advantage of the presence of Nanya, uh, which is here with us. Uh, Nanya is going to, to present uh, the future tool on poverty assessment, poverty impact assessment, the ideas which uh, which we are working on, uh, because um, um, uh, she, she's available today. Um, so we are going to look at a country case of fiscal space uh, in two weeks when uh, we will have a, another meeting um, in the afternoon on the 17th. So my, my idea here would be to uh, talk a little bit on concepts on financing. Um, I'm sorry if I bore uh, some of you. Uh, I know that you have had a, an initial session with Valerie, uh, with Alvaro as well, um, also with other people, uh, Celine, of course. Um, so I, I just wanted to maybe to to bring in a few um, uh, additional ideas that help um, find the place of of the issue of financing in the um, in the uh, yes in the overview uh, on the on the policy of the policy process, and then the policy dialogue itself, tools which we have to support the dialogue. Some of them you have already seen, and finally a very general. Uh, overview of the issue of fiscal space and possible sources because um, you will have uh, we will have um, additional sessions Alvaro will have two sessions with you in this sequence uh, so the next two sessions after this one will be with Alvaro and uh, then a third one with me and we will go through the different sources, uh, advantages, disadvantages, technical aspects, uh, and also political aspects that you need to take, take into account. I uh, would like to then to, if you agree with this, I would like to go um, ahead. So initially, sometimes social security is perceived as a savings relation. Uh, if you look at it from uh, the individual perspective, um, that might be correct. Uh, from the individual perspective, you perceiving social security as a savings relation where you pay contributions, you receive a benefit. Um, this, um, um, this relationship was one of the aspects which were analyzed by by a number of economists uh, towards the end of the uh, 19th century. For example, uh, Ben Bavek was an uh, Austrian economist. Uh, he was utilita uh, utilitarianist. Huh? So that means he, he looked at the, at the individual perspective and he saw a certain preference of people for present over future consumption. And they said, there, he said, there's a myopia vis-a-vis uh, -vis future consumption. And arguments like that um, turned social security, um, were used um, afterwards to make social security mandatory, uh, the affiliation to social security, because uh, otherwise people would, uh, would prefer present and not future consumption. But social security is not, not only a savings relation. Uh. Uh, then another perception that people usually have is that social security is a kind of a time machine. Uh. So um, sometimes social security is um, uh, depicted as if um, I, I was walking with a bag uh, full of money through my life and then at the end of my life I opened the bag of money. Uh, so this, this perspective is 
is related to the idea of a savings relation. And then at the end of my, my working life, I open the bag and I, I take the money out to pay for my pension. And um, uh, Social Security is, in fact, a kind of a time machine, uh, but it is, it is not a, a time machine where you walk through uh, with a bag of money, uh, you actually can transfer the expectation to have a right to have a benefit uh, when you need it. Uh, and, and that could be a pension, that could be a maternity benefit, that could be a sickness benefit, that could be a benefit for uh, due to an accident, due to invalidity. Um, and uh, what actually happens is uh, what is there on the next slide. Uh, social security is a very complex social contract uh, where uh, multiple actors uh, uh, participate. So there needs to be a, also a very complex financing structure. Uh, you will probably have uh, in, in, a, in a complete, in a major social security system, uh, you will have lots of cases, well, of different cases, solidarity between uh, those who are employed and those who are unemployed, in the case of the unemployment benefit uh, or cash transfers uh, to, to people who, 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 who are unemployed, um, um, transfers uh, between those who are healthy and those who are sick, huh? um, from those who are sane, who have not had a, uh, uh, an employment injury and those who, who are injured and so on. And each of the of the situations may require and actually in practice requires uh, different uh, parameters and different procedures uh, in terms of financing, different technical processes. Um, and then um, um, I, I like quoting um, uh, professors or, or um, uh, economists that, that were important uh, during my, my training uh, over over the, the decades. And one of them, um, I, I didn't know this person um, uh, directly, but um, uh, I read um, uh, about his writings, is a German professor called Fritz Mackenroth. And, and he, in 1952, he wrote that the financing will always come uh, from the current output. The, that means, um, um, the idea of a bag that you carry uh, through over, through time, uh, through a tunnel of time, um, is not not exact. Uh. You will have uh, uh, an, uh, of course, you will have consequences. You, it will be important for you to. Uh, for the balance, for the operation, for the uh, how the scheme operates in general, uh, which option, which financing method you choose, that's that's really uh, or, uh, that's true. So if you use a, a, a capitalization method or if you use pay as you go, for example, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that at the end financing has to come from the current output. So um, this is um, um, I sometimes sometimes you know the uh, pension privatization debate uh, which was was done in the 1990s, for example, suggested that um, uh, it was uh, that that privatizing pensions and transforming them into fully funded uh, was better because uh, the money would be would be there would be carried uh, through time and would be a guarantee but actually the capital stock you know, of a pension fund is invested and it generates interest from the current output i mean um, um, uh, at the end major social security systems will be uh, will work in a similar way uh, in in macroeconomic terms. Um, uh, another another professor, another um, e economist um, and political scientist uh, scientist I liked very much, and uh, fortunately I I met once uh, Gosta Esping Andersson. Um, uh, he's from Sweden, and he wrote um, uh, um, a book which was uh, which has the title "The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism." Um, it it is it ha he presents a typology that means um, uh, a typology is a way of classifying 
of highlighting uh, facts, um, uh, common facts uh, uh, within a certain category, uh, to categorize, to, to organize um, different cases. Here in this situation, it would be different countries or different regimes according to their main characteristics. Uh? And um, he says that you, you will find basically uh, countries in the world which uh, where the main principle is social insurance, uh, other countries where the main principle is the maybe the so-called uh, social democratic universalism, and uh, a third group of countries where you will find uh, the principle of targeting on poverty or fighting against poverty. Um, and the Example of the first uh, group, social insurance, would be um, uh, Germany, for example, uh, where uh, the right uh, to have access to a benefit comes from a contribution. Um, the benefits are financed out of the contribution revenue. And the, well, the example is the so-called Bismarckian welfare state, um, which has a limit uh, in terms of formalization of the labor market. Huh? Uh, so you need to push the, the limits uh, for, uh, forward to extend the limits by means of formalizing and of adapting uh, the contributory rules of this uh, kind of scheme. Uh, but well, a social insurance is more than an individual insurance, uh, than a private insurance. It is a, a solidarity um, um, scheme uh, that um, helps redistributing and 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 protecting against um, the risks, um, the main risks. Then the social democratic universalism comes from um, uh, Lord Beveridge. You certainly have heard about him, uh, Lord Beveridge in Great Britain. Um, uh, he, during the Second World War, elaborated a report, and that report uh, suggested um, how social protection should, could, would develop after the Second World War in order to uh, reduce um, uh, social tensions, in order to help reducing um, um, upheaval uh, political instability, uh, which finally uh, would lead to less war no, as well. Um, so this uh, universal um, uh, model uh, that uh, he he developed or, or that he proposed in, in general terms would be partly financed by contributions, partly by taxes, because uh, people would have the right to uh, at least basic benefits, uh, to at least a first uh, group of benefits which are financed out of taxes and supplemented by uh, a social insurance scheme uh, financed via contributions. So the right comes from being part, from being a citizen, from belonging to society. And uh, this was the, or is the model that has inspired the developments um, since uh, World War II. And then there is a third model, which is the fight against uh, poverty, uh, residual assistential welfare state, which is financed via taxation, basically via taxation. Um, and here the question is, are you poor? Uh, the right comes from need. So if you are below a certain poverty line, uh, then you receive a benefit uh, or you would you can classic qualify for a benefit if you are above poverty line, if you uh, have a certain wealth, uh, then you you do not uh, qualify for benefits. You will not find in the world um, uh, any country that is, uh, based only on one of the principles. Uh, you will probably find countries uh, which are um, um, which have a predominance of one of the principles. Let's take Germany, for example. Social insurance is uh, um, uh, an important, is a key principle, the backbone of the German welfare state. But then there are also universal benefits, uh, benefits that universalize the coverage. For example, child benefits are financed out of taxes, and every child has right to to a certain monetary benefit. Every child has right to um, uh, assistance, uh, to care in um, uh, from a certain age onwards, and so on. And you will 
will always also have uh, social assistance benefits which are targeted according to uh, to needs uh, so usually the countries would um, use or complement and and here the coordination mechanism is is key um, would would use uh, the three principles to coordinate uh, different uh, benefits. So looking at the financing, um, you see that contributions and taxes um, are the most important sources of financing of the three kinds of the three worlds of welfare capitalism. Um, and um, so rather contributions as part of a social insurance type or a um, social democratic universalism and taxes uh, to complement, to extend universal coverage beyond the contributory benefits and uh, to, to focalize, to, to target on uh, certain groups which are still excluded from, from coverage. So this is uh, more or less the, the trend that we have been seeing after the World War II. Uh, I would like to call your attention also to a book uh, which was published um, under the leadership of a former director of the Social Protection Department, Michael Sishon. Um, other colleagues, um, former colleagues of the uh, Social Protection Department and of the ILO um, are uh, also co-authors um, consultants of the ILO. Uh, this book will help you. Um, uh, this book will help you um, uh, answering to to many questions regarding financing, um, social protection, how to how to develop, how to uh, um, how to design the financing mechanisms. Um, for example, um, page one of that book. Um, says uh, the question why why do we why do we need to pay attention to financing social protection because an effective financing system guarantees that benefit promises can be kept uh, that the promises um, are reasonable that they are adequate uh, they are also sustainable in time and that you can keep your social protection system working over time. So you need to, to take care of financing systems um, so that uh, your system um, is stable over time. Um, another page which uh, I, I like very much uh, from, from Michael Sessions and, and colleagues work is here basic questions that define a financing system. Um, there is a um, a uh, sequence of five questions in one. Who pays, from what income, what amounts, in what moment of time, and for whom? And this, uh, the answer to these five questions basically defines uh, your financing system of your benefit scheme. Uh, so who pays uh, relates to the groups uh, which are covered, uh, for whom, also relates to the groups that are covered. The source of financing from what income? Is it uh, income on labor? Is it general income? Is it consumption? Is it um, another basis, another taxation basis? What amounts the proportions, the tax rates or the contribution rates and when? Uh, so uh, uh, the actuarial balance rule. Uh, so so that the, the system is kept uh, in balance over time. Uh, this question is uh, key. And to each of the parts of the questions, you will find answers in that book in the, along the different chapters. Mm, we're not going to, to, to go in depth here. Um, taxes and contributions. Um, Alvaro, in the following two sessions, will will speak about uh, taxes and contributions as sources of financing of social security systems. Um, besides um, another source of, of financing in the case of the contributory schemes are interests uh, resulting from the reserves um, that should be well invested. And others are usually residual, other sources, but um, they may be very important. It depends on the country, of course. So 
I, I remember uh, the case of, uh, for example, uh, countries that use uh, oil revenue uh, to to pay for benefits you know, uh, other countries use um, uh, other special taxation uh, to to finance uh, certain schemes so it it, it may be uh, important in in certain countries but on average um, the three most important sources are taxes and contributions and interests uh, that come from uh, the social protection systems. Then um, the methods, the usual method would be pay as you go or, or in the case of taxes, a tax transfer system. Um, you may have partial capitalization schemes and you may also have full capitalization schemes where you, you need to build a stock of, of capital that covers the whole of the liabilities of the regime. Of course, uh, full capitalization applies basically for long-term benefits, uh, pays you go for very short-term benefits, and partial capitalization can be used also for, for pensions or for, for example, for uh, employment injury benefits, uh, where you, you create a capital stock each time you concede a pension, for example, uh, a pension due to an employment injury or a survivor pension uh, due to an employment injury. Um, the, here are some examples of contributory or non-contributory schemes, uh, contributory mainly financed by contributions, non-contributory by taxes. And I think that with this, I finished the concept part. Um, now I would talk a few moments about the process of policy development. You will already have seen with Valerie, with uh, um, Alvaro, uh, the first part of this slide, um, the sequence of steps of the uh, assessment-based national dialogue methodology where you start with an inventory of the schemes, uh, you start collecting data, uh, then you identify and estimate the coverage gaps for a certain uh, risk, for a certain benefit. Uh, you would do a costing exercise and you would uh, estimate how much do you still need in terms of financing. Um, finally, well, the fourth step would be a fiscal space analysis in, in the sense of uh, which would be possible sources of financing for filling in that gap. Then a poverty impact assessment that allows you to uh, know how much, um, how effective or how um, uh, the impact, the, con the consequence that your benefit scheme would have. Um, Fighting poverty or preventing poverty is one of the goals of social protection systems. Uh, replacing income is another uh, important task that social protection systems uh, have to uh, comply with. And finally, well, you would reach policy recommendations. I, when I, when I was um, a student, um, in um, I studied economics and a little bit of political science in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, public policy was a uh, a subject I, I enjoyed very much at university. And I remember that in the uh, public policy classes, we discussed about agenda setting, uh, that somebody needs to, to, to be the leader, um, that there needs to be um, a, a discourse that is created, um, the a public agenda, um, gives priority to certain subjects uh, and social protection needs to be promoted as an important component of that agenda. Uh, the government or the act actors, national actors, need to forge a coalition in favor of the uh, issue of extending social protection. Um, there are processes for getting agreements, for, for building consensuses. Then there are also learning processes. Sometimes you do uh, a step forward, sometimes you need to uh, go back to a previous step, but um, with new information, with a new experience, you can Im 
improve your understanding, you can reframe problems, you improve um, um, the vision um, in terms of how to overcome economic constraints, um, how to better articulate uh, different interests um, as well around the, the proposal. And then the issue of uh, ownership, of appropriation by national actors of the 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 process and of the results of the process i i you know when when i looked at this slide no, i i remembered of the public policy classes and um i i thought that it was uh, interesting to mention to you that um maybe some of you have had those um those uh experiences as well and um, it is very very helpful uh, to to uh, use your your skills in terms of public policy to support our national actors in developing uh, such a, a, a process then of course our method says uh, recommends that uh, everything is done by means of social dialogue with capacity building and um, our tripartite constituents are uh, key um, other interested parties of course other government agencies um, donors uh, or development partners other uh, united nations agencies uh, are uh, uh, allies are extremely helpful to 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 build uh, the arena to build a favorable environment and to have a dialogue that allows for for results for convergences for building consensus uh, along this process um, here are some tools, um, ABND methodology, you have already heard about it. The RAP was presented by Andres and by Nanya. Um, there are two uh, actuarial tools, ILO Health and ILO Pensions, which are now online. Um, there is a handbook on fiscal space. I'm going to uh, talk a few minutes about that in, in a moment. And then there is um, uh, a poverty impact assessment tool, which we are elaborating um, currently. And uh, Nanya is going to, to present about that. Uh, it's important that we always try to use those tools in such a way that the ownership, the national ownership is, is strengthened, that, that our national actors are empowered. And finally, well, um, um, there are some some expected results uh, that people understand which are their options, that uh, people create confidence, that people uh, have an, uh, a clear uh, idea of the feasibility of the uh, options to create fiscal space. Um, uh, to, they know which is the impact on poverty of the different options. Um, and that they are also capable of discussing strategies to support specific groups that need special uh, additional measures. For example, uh, rural population, um, women uh, also uh, have um, the double board burden or the triple burden sometimes. Um, informal sector workers, um, require uh, also um, different approaches, uh, self-employed uh, groups, etc. Um, so this is um, the policy process, and if you if you agree, I would quickly go through the um, the tools. So the first of them is the social security inquiry. I think that you haven't been introduced to the social security inquiry yet um, i'm going here to this next page um, social security inquiry is a tool that helps you to um, collect information uh, and to have a, a review an overview of the social protection system it is also a tool that helps us in the ilo to uh, feed the world social protection database and uh, to to produce, for example, the World Social Protection Report. Then you will find uh, the dashboards on the web page of the Social Protection Department with uh, different indicators in terms of social protection. And uh, they result from um, um, uh, the work of many people collecting uh, information by means of the Social Security Inquiry. Um, 
Nanya is going to to speak about well she has already spoken about rap and she's going to speak about a fifth uh, a fifth tool that uh, we are developing and that uh, we hope that we can um, bring it on the quantitative platform on social security uh, at some point in future so my final words would be about the issue of fiscal space um, there is um, fiscal space is a concept that is usually managed by the IMF. Uh, there is a recent definition from 2016 uh, that uh, relates fiscal space to the possibility of a government to increase spending or to reduce taxes without putting in peril market access, fin financial market access or uh, even the debt sustainability. Well, this is, um, uh, I think, an important reference. Um, you need to keep macroeconomic balances. But then there is also, a, let's say, an, an additional dimension, which was um, uh, developed in a handbook for assessing financing options uh, by ILO, UN Women, and UNICEF, um, where fiscal space is seen in a more let's say, proactive way, um, meaning that uh, resources can be, um, can be the, 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 the fiscal space uh, can be developed proactively by, by states, by governments. Uh, it can be shaped. Uh, it is not just a statica, statical result of a, of a market constellation. Uh, so the market constellation is important, but you can develop new sources of financing for your social protection system. Um, some key messages here, um, maybe uh, first of them is that the states uh, have an obligation to realize human rights. And so resources need to be used uh, to their maximum availability. Then there are multiple options for developing fiscal space. We're going to see eight of them. Um, putting social protection in competition against other social policies is not a good practice. Uh, for uh, creating fiscal space for social protection. So we do not want to reduce uh, the right to water, the right to education, the right to housing, um, um, and increase uh, fiscal space for social protection. We want the human rights to be fulfilled as a whole. And uh, well, uh, every country has a specific context, so it needs uh, a special analysis in terms of which are the best sources of financing for social protection. And um, these results should be, as, as we have seen before, submitted to a national dialogue process. Um, I'm not going to, to talk about more details like that. Well, here you have eight different sources of financing which are dealt in depth in the handbook, which I just uh, presented to you. So the first two of them are uh, the main national domestic sources of, of funding for social protection. So contributory revenue and tax revenue. Uh, then the sources number three to eight are important ones, but they are rather complementary to the effort of expanding sources number one and two, because in the long run, you will need to have either taxes or contributions or both uh, building the backbone of your system. Of course, that in cases of countries with, a, with lower income, uh, overseas development assistance, foreign aid are very important. Uh, restructuring of debt uh, is important so that countries uh, need to pay less in terms of interest and that uh, fiscal space um, becomes available and so on. Um, I don't I'm not going to, to go in depth here, uh, just to mention here on the right, you see a title of a document, uh, Financing Gaps in Social Protection. There is an estimation of how much countries should um, or need to uh, invest 
in addition to what they are already doing to fulfill the gap for a social protection floor. And uh, of course, uh, the proportion for the low income countries is quite big. You see it there, the small figures there down 15.9% of GDP would be how much the low income countries require in addition to what they are currently spending. Um, middle income countries require quite important amounts as well. And this is annually. Um, uh, and um, I, I would say that um, middle income countries, they um, are on a, I mean, in a, in, a, in a better, comparably better condition to develop uh, already domestic sources because usually they, they can uh, uh, quickly strengthen the formalization processes of labor markets or they could they could improve their tax administration system and increase the tax revenue, whereas low income countries uh, usually need to build the, the institutionality and uh, overseas development assistance would be very important in helping uh, to start that process. So this is um, uh, the, this is the basically the message. Um, we're going to go in depth on uh, the different um, on the different sources over the next um, the next sessions. Alvaro in the next two sessions, and and me in the third in the third one. And so, if there is uh, any question, um, fine. I'm going to stop sharing now, and. Um, <coughs> I hope how how did did I stop sharing, Alvaro? No, not yet. Now I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so Alvaro, if there is any question, um, I'm available, and uh, if if not, uh, maybe we give the floor to um, to Nanya, who has joined us, and who who would talk a little bit about uh, the issue of estimating impacts on poverty and uh, uh, the future tool that we are about to develop in the social protection department. So back to you, Alvaro. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helmut. I see Bob Muchawaiwa has left his hand. Go ahead, Bob. Thank, <clears throat> thanks so much, uh, Ramos and uh, Helmut. This is a very comprehensive input. I must say huge thanks to you. I have two questions. Number one, may you briefly elaborate on the uh, one of the fiscal space policy options, the flexible macroeconomic frame? I mean, I've seen it in your publications, in your presentations as well. And I'm wondering how how different is it from increasing tax revenue, or you know how how maybe just briefly elaborate on that. That will be useful. And then the second uh, question I have is, in your last presentation, you showed us some funding gaps as a percentage of GDP, but also in uh, absolute dollars. And one of the questions that we've been grappling with, and I'm from UNICEF, is do we have um global financing benchmarks for low middle income mid for, for low income middle income countries for example how much they should be spending on social protection as a percentage of gdp or in absolute terms uh, so which we can use you know for advocacy purposes or is this something we should be thinking about then uh, my last uh, uh, comment and this is just for all stakeholders here present is there is a big issue on public availability of data on social protection financing in general. Do we want to, what can we do maybe uh, after this course or because if you look at yeah, your database, right? You will find lots of gaps, even World Bank, even IMF, there is no data really that is up to date on social protection financing, especially in low and middle income countries. And I'm coming from the Eastern and Southern Africa region. It's a big, big, big issue. And I'm just thinking perhaps it's a high time we coalesce efforts and support governments to ensure this data is publicly available. Your thoughts? Back to you, Ramos and uh, Helmut. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think that each of the questions would require a, a, um, a longer explanation. But very, very quickly, um, I think that the issue, yes, you're right in terms of the data availability. The data availability is, uh, is, re is relatively low. Um, I think that one of the one of the 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 goals um, that we we should set uh, maybe in in a collaboration among different agencies is to improve the the availability of information about the different sources of financing that countries um, have been using and and uh, the 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 development over. Uh, the last years and maybe decades, if possible, because that will be will be very interesting. Um, of course, it is uh, related to the to the economic development processes um, uh, in in the medium and long term. Uh, then uh, you mentioned uh, you, you, an, another question of yours is uh, related to um, to middle income countries. Yeah, there are figures for middle-income countries, and that document, which was, which was quoted there, um, if you if you take a look at it, there are also um, tables which show um, the information by geographical groups, um, which show more detail about that information here. Just presented a uh, flash uh, figure. Um, uh, while we still do not have this uh, information by country, but maybe this is an idea huh, as well to develop a tool that helps uh, that helps uh, taking a, an initial look huh, at, uh, let's say, to 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 compare in uh, in. In, in, in a global frame, uh, the situation of different countries, but we are still far away from that. Uh, so we, we still need to, to build that tool. We still would need to collect and to, to process the, the data that, that, that would be uh, feeding such a tool. And um, the first question is about the macroeconomic framework. The macroeconomic framework, um, um, well, we usually uh, have um, a macroeconomic framework which is quite rigid um, uh, in terms of uh, assumptions. Um, um, many countries use inflation targeting, many countries uh, have a target in terms of uh, primary surpluses. Um, and um, well, uh, if you relax some of the macroeconomic assumptions under conditions, especially over the last years, well, the current situation, the crisis reaction is is different from from the the previous years, and hopefully different from from the years to come. Uh, but uh, um, if you are a little bit less stringent. Uh, in some of the assumptions, then you could uh, have a fiscal space of uh, um, a sm a small margin or maybe even a little bit more than a small margin and half a percentage point of GDP, for example, allows to finance a cash transfer program like Bosa Familia. No? Uh, or, or allows to finance uh, a, a quite a good uh, social pension program in countries which do not have uh, um, a reasonable social pension programs yet. So, um, you know, um, it, it, it depends, of course, on the, on the situation of the respective country. No? So, Alvaro, thank you. Back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Helmut. Um, indeed, in one of my sessions, we will discuss <clears throat> a bit more about the macroeconomic framework. Um, let us not forget that the, besides the fiscal deficit part and fiscal board, that sometimes are extremely rigid, as Helmut already mentioned. You also have the monetary policy part, which sometimes also has very rigid rules. So to some extent, um, what, when we say a more accommodating framework is about lessening a bit the rigidity of the world without losing um, the objective of the world, which of course they were not developed just to harm people, but at least we hope that 
that they were not yet developed to harm people, but um, of course um, <clears throat> they were developed to provide a more stable macroeconomic behavior in and fiscal behavior and monetary behavior. So, but sometimes they went too far in one direction, but I don't want to uh, spend much more time on this. Um, we will return to this in one of my sessions. So thank you very much, Helmut. Um, again, now we can give the floor to Nanya if there are no more questions. And there could be questions after Nanya's presentation, of course. Um, come in, Nanya. Thank you. Hello. Um, hi, oh. I'm I'm just turning on my video for a minute to, to say hi and show you who I am and how I am. Um, I will just very briefly go through a short presentation, I hope it will be short, on um, the poverty impact assessment tool. Um, the tool's not, it, it's in, in process, It's uh, it's been conceptualized, we have uh, the mathematical specifications coming along, uh, but just so you know, it's going to very closely follow the structure of the tools that Helmut, Helmut and um, Andreas and I um, in, discussed already as part of the QPSS, the Quantitative Platform on Social Security. Uh, so I'll just quickly take you through the presentation. Okay, perfect. So you can see uh, my screen, right? Okay. Yeah, we see. So, yeah, so here is the ILO uh, Poverty Impact Assessment Tool. It's part of the quantitative platform on Social Security. Um, these are a set of tools that we are developing. And the idea of the tool itself is that we have um, a, more, a mathematical model uh, that is that has a structured protocol that systematizes uh, the projection and calculation of a set of social protection programs on poverty. So the idea being that uh, as you go through the A, B, and D process and you discover, you, know, you discover, okay, uh, you have, you categorize first, uh, these are the social protection policies and programs that we have in place, uh, these are some of the gaps that may exist, then you can use this model uh, to kind of figure out what would the impact be uh, if we gave one of the groups uh, this new benefit or if we increased another benefit by a little bit. I'll go more into detail on this, uh, but just to give you a bit of context. Um, the historical context is that at the ILO, uh, of course, we've already been working on a lot of micro simulation models. So models that take survey data that um, so micro data of individuals or households um, and use that to create this dynamic model where you can exactly input, uh, say, a change of, let's say, five US dollars per month. Um, to a new mother uh, and then find out how much that will cost you and also how much that what, a, what an impact it will have on the incomes uh, and income poverty of the mother but then also the family and the population in general. We already have this at the ILO uh, with under the framework of um, evidence-based policy making towards a universal social protection floor, uh, but this this would aim to then systemi systematize that into a model that anybody can use. Uh, we have tools such as the SSI, which Helmut talked about, that already captures some of this data that we can later use uh, to inform the World Social Protection Database and the World Social Protection Reports that come out every year. Uh, it goes under uh, the Convention 102, Recommendation 202, which are gearing uh, countries up to work towards a universal social protection floor. 
with the four social protection guarantees of uh, uh, essential health care, that's including maternity care, uh, basic income security for children, for persons in active employed age, uh, as well as for older persons. And uh, yeah. So a bit of background, uh, as I already explained, it builds on previous poverty assessments, uh, but it makes it into an online tool that's part of this platform. All of the tools here, uh, as we presented the, the wrap last time, um, they follow a similar format in, in the sense that they're intended to be extremely easy to use. So you don't necessarily need to have knowledge of uh, the mathematical uh, formulations. Um, you don't need to have advanced knowledge of Excel. Uh, what you do need to have is uh, good data and then this also uh, works towards improving the data that is um, that is collected and uh, at country level. Uh, but yeah, the idea is that it's a very easy to use tool. Uh, it has a consistent methodology. You can enter the system. It's intuitive to use. Uh, and existing sources of microdata that we already have, for example, ILO stat, uh, Aspire of the World Bank, the Luxembourg Income Study, and uh, the what is it? The EU um, statistics on income and living conditions which all collect information on which all collect information on social uh, protection and uh, related uh, programs they they can already be used to input data for each country for population groups for uh, their incomes and uh, populate this model Uh, okay, so we already talked about um, in Helmut's presentation the ABMD process, but just to be very clear, uh, here uh, to we have a tool under the QPSS for each of the parts of the ABMD process. So, for example, for the to take an inventory of existing social protection schemes, uh, we have the SSI, which details by the social protection guarantee, uh, maternity, children older persons, uh, it details the list of programs in each country. Uh, we have the RAP tool, uh, which you saw earlier as well, which helps identify and estimate coverage and financing gaps. Uh, we also have ILO pensions and ILO health, which can help go into more detail on pensions uh, and health programming. And then, uh, you know, we have the poverty impact assessment tool, which allows after we have uh, taken an inventory and identified the gaps in existing programs, uh, then it helps us do projections for the future to see the impacts on future incomes. Uh, here we go. Okay. So the process is not too difficult. Uh, first, we have the inputs, where we have the inputs of microdata, uh, that is basic uh, information on, here we go, I'll show you, uh, the individuals, their ages, whether it the information is at individual or household level, uh, the sex of individuals in households, uh, the disability status, the residential status, whether they're in urban or rural areas, and then the income levels, which can then be used to calculate poverty status uh, as well as, well, through household income and, quali and yeah, qualify, categorize uh, individuals or households as poor, non-poor, extremely poor. Uh, that helps us sort everybody in uh, each entry in, in the microdata into a, a group, a benefit group or a population group, uh, and then it can help us design uh, schemes or model existing schemes to uh, map out the impact on income. I'll go back to this slide. So this is the input. So we input the microdata along the lines of the table I just showed you. Then we create, um, or we also input information on poverty lines, uh, on the national poverty lines or national 
uh, extreme poverty lines, and this can also sometimes differ between uh, rural and urban areas. Using this information, that is the income of households, uh, their, their poverty status, we can define uh, the poverty, sorry, the population groups to which we will give a benefit. We can also define the benefits, uh, maternity benefit, uh, a benefit for children, a benefit for uh, people who are in active age or older persons, and how uh, how our, our coverage is now and how we want it to change in the future uh, towards a universal social protection floor. Uh, we can then uh, compare these aggregates of incomes by households. We can compare them to the poverty lines, uh, check poverty groups, uh, sorry, poverty rates for each population group, and then see that uh, at a population level as well. Um, by doing that, once we apply the benefits to each group, uh, we can take uh, we can aggregate each each group so um, calculating a final impact on the incomes and then also changes in the poverty rate. Let's see. Um, I won't spend too much time on the exact variables, but here you just saw the table uh, that we filled in which has household IDs, their incomes, uh, their disability status, uh, their residential status, and their statistical weight. Uh, then we can define the poverty lines. Uh, we can aggregate those, uh, define, uh, see their, their poverty status, um, and then see the levels for each group or at the complete pover, uh, population level. Uh, the benefits of this model are that anybody in, in any country with any kind of setup can customize it uh, a lot for any kind of scheme or benefit, uh, of course, in income terms, uh, defining scheme characteristics or the different numbers of schemes and benefits in a model, uh, or really uh, using the parameters that we have set, which are fairly general on purpose, uh, to then um, define who will receive a benefit in a given population group. Uh, exactly, so we can set age or sex limits, uh, financial uh, thresholds for people to receive the benefit, uh, and then also the length of the uh, length of the the benefits. So, if, for example, in the case of maternity benefits, um, it may be a year. Uh, in the case of older persons, that may be a longer period, and uh, but only starting after, for example, 65 years of age, uh, and so on. The tool really allows for that flexibility for us to change it according to each country and. Uh, into the data very easily. It also allows for data validation, for consistency checks, because at every stage you see uh, and you get to explore the data uh, and there are some automatic calculations that are that are done that allow you to, to check at every stage. Um, well, the poverty level that uh, is coming out of the data that I entered uh, for, for the population um, is uh, is one thing, but our national statistics say something else. So either there is um, an issue with the data that was entered, or maybe uh, that indicates that the calculations for poverty need to be done um, again at, at the national level. Um, the data entry functionalities, as we saw in the wrap tool, it's very simple. It looks like an Excel sheet um, or like a table. Um, you just enter data uh, for each scheme or and then you input in a very structured way the microdata. And then it's uh, it, it's the model calculates. It does the. Um, the consistency checks and the validations 
uh, automatically and you can check manually through that. Uh, what's also good about this model that I haven't mentioned here yet, but I will, is that multiple users can work in it at the same time. So for example, uh, you could be entering data on one type of benefit and your colleague on another, and um, then you take turns in checking the data of, that the other person entered, and that's another good consistency check uh, that can be, be done because you can work at the same time, you can get work done in, in half the time or less, uh, and at the same time it's consistently and constantly being verified and uh, checked. Uh, and of course, you have the ability to input data from the SSI or the World Social Protection Database. Uh, this is already data that exists in a structured format. We are working on uh, harmonizing all the tools, uh, this, the RAP, the SSI. So ideally, we should have a similar format. Um, so if you already enter data into the SSI or the RAP tool, um, I, you have the option of automatically populating the poverty impact assessment tool, which I think just makes it a one easier step towards uh, creating, towards doing that uh, analysis uh, of of what impact the policies will have on poverty beforehand, um, and it makes it much easier and and faster and uh, automatic in a way. Uh, and the model itself, uh, like I mentioned, also just has these. Excel-like abilities, uh, where you can very simply copy-paste, um, do simple functionalities, uh, one number plus another number, uh, divisions, uh, and so on. And if not, you can always do those in Excel and import or export the sheets into the model. And this is consistent for all the tools of the QPSS uh, for that reason, just to make it much easier to work in. Um, the tool is, a, yeah, it is a, it's created with an eye towards um, security. So every uh, team or every country team gets a private workspace that no other unauthorized user has access to. Uh, the user interface is available in multiple languages. Uh, we currently have uh, in for the RAP tool, we have uh, English, French, and Spanish, and uh, we are working on on more languages. And similarly, we will be doing that for uh, the poverty impact assessment tool. Uh, so any user can go in and in and access their workspace without fear of uh, someone who doesn't have a user profile or is, or is from a different uh, country or team or unauthorized to use that workspace uh, entering uh, by accident. Uh, that's not a possibility uh, as all the spaces are separated. Um, you have We have different authorization levels as well. So for example, some members of a team may only have access to enter data, others may have access to create models and so on. Um, this is again something that we have already created for the QPSS. So if you have an account uh, for one tool, you can also use, uh, you can use the same profile to enter the poverty impact assessment tool, but again, only in your authorized workspace. Um, and as I mentioned, it's it, it allows really for people to work in teams and consult with each other. Uh, so that data data entry is faster, but then also uh, more accurate. Uh, we really intend for this tool to be useful for a variety of reasons. Above all, the fact that it's uh, it is an evidence based policy making tool uh, that really allows for uh, identifying gaps in existing policies. It allows for planning and costing of social protection policies uh, because you get a clear idea uh, of how much each uh, program will cost. The most important um, part is that you can see uh, beforehand the, the impact on, on different groups. Um, 
in different areas to a very detailed level. Uh, you can break it down not just by the different kind of population group or uh, the intended group for a specific benefit, but you can also break it down by urban or rural uh, parts of that same group or by gender. And, and these things are really intended to create eventually uh, the case for investing in un uh, universal social protection um, and it should it's a tool that should make that process much easier uh, and it can be used by people in government but then it can also be used by uh, by uh, well by us uh, supporting work in government uh, to assist decision making and policy formulation at a national level. Uh, the package, like all the other tools, it includes not just the tool, but then also a user manual. Uh, this is a sample for ILO Health. Uh, the user manual is, is a long, uh, it's a 200 page manual in the case of health. Uh, I think it will be shorter for this tool and for the WAP tool, um, but it really it takes you through the concepts behind the, each model. It takes you through some of the specifications, the technical specifications, the math math mathematical specifications, and then it also goes through a step-by-step -step work uh, working example of uh, how to uh, input data and how to see results and, and so on in the tool. Uh, we already have those for ILO Health and pensions, and we're working on them for RAP and the Poverty Impact Assessment Tool. Uh, and then, of course, we also intend to have e-learning uh, e-learning courses on on this tool. Uh, we've done a couple of very, I would say, useful and well attended uh, sessions for ILO Health and ILO pensions. And we intend to do that so that uh, people from, well, our, our partners within the ILO and then also uh, people who are interested in using them directly uh, can already start expressing their interest and working in the tool and then also in initial stages help us test the tools and improve them uh, because we have uh, that constant improvement uh, and back-end support for that as part of as part of the package. And I think and that that's it from my end uh, on the tool for now. But I'm very happy to take questions, or we can also take questions uh, for Helmut's presentation. Thank you very much, um, Nanya, for that wonderful presentation. Are there any questions? Um, Helmut, you wanted to come Yes, I, I want first, <clears throat> firstly, I want to thanks uh, to express my gratitude to Nanya for the presentation. Um, I think it's clear that this is a work in progress, <clears throat> that um, the tool is still not available as such for use, but um, uh, the idea of presenting it here is also listening to to you, um, maybe, maybe now, maybe uh, in future, um, uh, and and knowing from you if um, um, uh, the way is correct, if um, what can be improved in in on the this track, and uh, and how do you think um, we could um, we could continue the work, continue working on that? Um, just to so probably some people would like to would ask. Um, when would such a tool be available? Well, um, as Nanya said, um, the concept is uh, uh, is there. Uh, the mathematical specifications have been done, which are a very important part of the work. Uh, then um, uh, the programming is still to be to be done. So the the creation of the software, I think. Uh, 
uh, Nania, please confirm to me, um, is still at the very beginning. Uh, and then after creating uh, a first version of the software, we need to apply uh, the tool in, an, in a few cases so that uh, we know um, 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 in, in two or three concrete cases uh, which were the results and uh, before releasing it uh, to, to, to general use. Huh? Um, so this, is, this would be the process. I don't know if this is in one year or if it is in, in one and a half years uh, or if it is in less years, uh, but it also depends on, on the availability of funds because uh, the programming costs uh, something. Uh, we need the support of, uh, of qualified people. So we usually do it uh, uh, in parallel to the projects. We use some funds of the projects to, uh, to, to program. That was the case of RAP. That was the case of uh, the two actuarial models that, uh, that are now online and we, that are ready to be used. So hope that over the next biennium, um, because the ILO works in terms of biennium, not two years, uh, the next program cycle of the, uh, the next two years, we, we have that tool ready to be used. Huh? Did I say something wrong, Nanya? Is that correct? No, yeah? absolutely. I, I think that uh, we hope uh, to start working on the technical side uh, so exactly developing the software um, early next year because we are I think we have a very clear idea of what we what we want and the specifications are there uh, so we just need to start um, we've been winding up also wrap uh, the wrap tool and, and those things so very soon but uh, in that in the meanwhile um, if you see this and you have any, uh, I would say, ideas or things that could be useful in, in a process like this at your end, uh, it's a simple enough idea. Um, it's income poverty for the moment. Uh, it uses uh, microdata that already exists. Uh, but if you have any ideas for anything that could make this better, uh, we'd be happy to take them and, and use them in our um, software building. Alvaro. <clears throat> so everything was very clear, I guess, but um so maybe to remind a bit the context for the presentation. Um let me remind you we are discussing the important among many other objectives of this training of persuading um for instance finance ministers of the importance of investing in social protection. So we want evidence based tool that will I'll enable us to say not just, you know, social protection is really important, but more like social protection in this program is really important because it will have this impact, for example, on poverty, and that we can provide them with um, specific data. So just to sort of <clears throat> um, build a bridge from what Nanja just presented and Helmut just presented to what we are trying to accomplish in, within the training. So, um, I don't know if you'd like to add something to that, um, Helmut or Nanja? So, any questions? So, uh, we are almost done with the time. Well, I'm sure Nanja and Helmut will be very happy to, to receive any question in the future or any input you wish after you think more about it, any input you wish to provide them. Um, thank you so much, Helmut and Nanja, for, for being with us today. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you found you all found it um, useful, the presentation. The, um, let me remind you that next week is normal again. Um, we will have two sessions, uh, as opposed to only one this week. Um, and also, I'd like to make a very slight correction to Helmut um, at position of next session. I will not teach the next two sessions. There is one session by UNICEF on Monday, 
then I teach on Thursday. And then the following week, I teach one and Helmut teaches the last one. So, the, the, so that you know that there is one more session by Anthony Holch of UNICEF. Um, but the, the, the only clarification, and uh, well, I guess I will see you on Monday. Um, thank you very much for your time again, and have a great day. Thank you. Good day to everyone. Thank you, Alvaro. Bye. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Nanya. Thanks, Hamid, and thanks, Alvaro.